probably tell us what species it is. Okay, so that's the first part of um, sort of logistics here. I just want to make sure that we're using the chat function uh, and that we'll be uh, fielding questions at the end, of course, but also a couple of times throughout the, um, the presentation as well. Okay, uh, that's sort of logistical point number one. Logistical point number two, and I only have two of them actually, uh, is about eBird itself. So I take it as axiomatic that our familiarity with eBird is all over the place here. I imagine some of you all are just curious about eBird. You're, um, you've heard of it, you've sampled, you've, uh, you haven't inhaled yet, I suppose, uh, you, but, but you're, you're generally aware of and not much more than that about eBird. Uh, others of you all are eBird heavy hitters. In fact, I see some of you all among the uh, uh, participants here already. So we've got folks here who are relatively new to eBird or just casual users, and we have some uh, heavy users, possibly even abusers of eBird as well. But that's actually absolutely fine because eBird is evolving so rapidly, it's changing so quickly, it's rolling out new functionality so rapidly that even if you're really familiar with eBird, for example, perhaps the way that I am and that Sue is and Nick are, and Nick is, um, we're still learning lots of cool new things about eBird because eBird keeps changing. So I think that um, all of us have something to learn today. So I know it's sort of a, uh, uh, maybe an immodest thing of me to think that I have something to say to everybody here, but I do think that if we sort of wipe the slate clean and just sort of imagine that we're all starting over with eBird this evening, uh, we'll all be on the same playing field and I think we'll do fairly well um, together with one another. Uh, the other thing too is that I think it's a good idea, especially if you've been doing something for a long time, to maybe um, re-examine old habits, perhaps old bad habits. Uh, so we're going to be addressing some matters here that I think possibly pertain to people who've been doing eBird a bit too longer and maybe a bit longer, maybe a bit too more than is good for them. So uh, again, for those of you all who've been doing it for a long time, I think I'll have something new for you as well as we go along here. And I want to get those two points of preamble out of the way. And at this point, I'm going to um, attempt to share my screen and fire up a presentation against Sue or Nick. If something goes wrong, please let me know about it. Um, actually, it says host has disabled attendee screen sharing. So if somebody could... Uh, enable the screen sharing, that would be great. I'm currently disabled. Can anybody do that for me? Is anybody out there? Um, Ted, I'm working on it. Okay, thank you. I'll stand by. Let's see what happened here, let's see. We're experiencing technical difficulties, as they used to say. Diana Beatty says, up at the top. Up at the top. Hmm. Maybe like way at the top under zoom.us. Just guessing. Folks, this was working great a few minutes before the meeting started. We know it can be done. Maybe somebody should give the controls to Diana. Mm -hmm. All right, now, now try. Let me hold on a second. I just, uh, I just enabled screen sharing. Okay, let me try now. But I didn't. Okay. Know All right, we have we have ignition. All righty. So, um, can you all see my screen? Not yes. Necessary. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, I'm going to share computer sound because we'll need that and share uh, some videos. And we're going to fire up the presentation right here. So if all goes according to plan, if all goes according to plan. Okay, very good. I hope that all of you all are looking at a bush tit right now. Is that the case? Can yes. I get a yes? Excellent. Okay. <laughs> we have uh, gotten past what was by far the most difficult uh, technical aspect of our time together this evening. It's all smooth sailing from here. All right. So we're going to be looking at eBird, eBird for everyone. Um, and there are a couple of keywords in here. Uh, we're going to be talking about a crowdsourced resource. That means it's something that uh, all of us contribute to. Uh, there's the O word in there, ornithology. I know that we're birders and we do birding, but there's actually a scientific or ornithological component to all of this. Uh, and then I acknowledge that we are 
birding in an unusual time, the age of hashtag social distancing. So those are three kind of uh, key ideas. They're crowdsourcing, scientific ornithology, and social distancing will be sort of uh, background themes as we go along this evening. All right, let's actually get underway now. So here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to do either of the following. Number one, I'm not going to subject you to a drop dead boring tutorial on exactly how to go through eBird step by step by step. It would take a long time and I would lose all of you all way before we got done anyhow. That would be very, very boring. So we're not going to do that. Uh, the second thing we're not going to do is have a sort of a conceptual and philosophical and almost sort of like a programmatic understanding of what eBird's all about, you know, way big picture. I think we can just sort of get um, lost in the weeds if we do that as well. So we're not going to do a step-by-step -step tutorial. We're not going to look at eBird big picture philosophical. What we're going to do instead is we're going to go bird watching together. That's right. We're going to have a communal bird watching experience here in just a moment. And as we go bird watching together, we will be doing so in um, the context of compiling an eBird checklist. Now, we're not really going to all gather at my house here for a uh, flash mob of uh, nighttime birding in Lafayette, but we actually are going to be birding together in Lafayette. I went birding this morning, and I'm going to be sharing with you the experience of birding this morning, and I'm going to be sharing that experience, as I said, specifically in the context of compiling an eBird checklist. All right. Well, I'm in Boulder County, as Nick mentioned. I'm specifically in Lafayette, and especially for those of you all in Colorado, you probably know some of the hot spots around Boulder, um, Baseline Reservoir, Boulder Reservoir, the feeders up in Ward, uh, Walden Ponds, uh, Greenlee Preserve, of course. But we're not going to go birding at any of those places. In fact, we're going to go birding at a place that I know is the sort of place that a lot of you all ask about when it comes to eBird. And this is the question of, does eBird really want my data? And the answer is yes, eBird wants your data, even if it comes from the Walmart in Lafayette. So we're gonna be birding at the Walmart in Lafayette this morning. Our entire activity this evening is going to be based on the time I spent birding and that you'll spend birding with me in a moment here at the Walmart in Lafayette. Um, I will point out before we get underway here that I glanced at my phone this morning. I noted that it was uh, 8.42 in the morning and that it was partly cloudy and that the temperature was 39 degrees. This is one of the key, central, overarching, most important aspects of eBird. It is what we call a, a geotemporally referenced database. Everything in eBird has to be at a point in space and time. You can't do eBird if you don't know what day it is and what time it is. So we're in Lafayette. We're specifically at the Walmart. It's 842 in the morning. And note that it is partly cloudy and 39 degrees at 842 in the morning. Ed, yeah, we need you to minimize all of the participants screen on your computer. Oh, that's a good one. Thank you. Uh, Sorry for interrupting. No, that's great. Thank you. Did that work? I'm not sure. Oh, yes. Yes, okay. yes, it did. Thank you. Okay, they all went away. Now, I need to make sure that you, someone's out there still, right? If, 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 if I suddenly, yes. here, please come back and tell me. Okay. Oh, and by the way, um, the only people whose voices I should be able to hear, of course, are going to be Sue's and Nick's. So Sue and Nick, please let me know if something terrible happens, because as of now, I can't see anybody. Alrighty, um, moving right along, if you look atop that wall, Mart, um, you can see that there is a bird there, uh, sort of in between the letters M and A and right above. And oh, maybe it's a crow or a uh, pigeon or something. Oh, whoops, sorry about that. Um, there we go. Uh, actually, it's not. As some of you all may have surmised, that is a plastic owl. Plastic owls are put up on top of Walmart to keep birds away from the Walmart. And this actually, in a joking way, but kind of a serious way, gets at the second part of, uh, the, the second big thing about eBird. We only eBird live birds that we see during the time of our checklist. Now, a plastic owl is of course um, absurd, but suppose you found the feather of a dusky grouse 
uh, in this parking lot, or perhaps a dead dusky grouse in this parking lot. You would not eBird that because it was not a live bird that you saw during the time of your checklist. So just a point here that we don't count fake owls, but we also don't count uh, what biologists call signs. So indication that the bird was there, but we didn't see the live bird itself. Uh, as I said a moment ago, uh, plastic owls are put up to scare off birds, but that doesn't always, whoops, try that, work. Uh, we are looking at a European starling here, and let me make one adjustment here. Um, not to Norky there. Okay, I'll try that. All righty. Uh, we can see a starling, and let me move this out of the way up on top of our owl here. Uh, this is a bird that has sort of a, a mix of spotted and shiny plumage. We can see uh, the uh, spots, especially in the belly and then up the uh, sagittal plane of the bird. So this is a bird that is um, coming into what we call its breeding plumage aspect. Starlings look very, very different. That's funny, I just saw Bob Mulvihill's name and here I am talking about molt. This must be the birding gods uh, talking to me. But anyhow, Bob, Bob Mulvihill, by the way, is a molt expert from uh, Western Pennsylvania. Hi, Bob. Okay, so uh, this starling here is a bird uh, that looks drastically different in fall uh, versus spring or uh, winter versus summer. But instead of molting into a spring plumage, it acquires its spring plumage by wear. Those white spots wear off and the bird acquires its shiny plumage. So we're looking at a bird here, a starling, a European starling, up on top of our owl, and it is uh, acquiring what we call its breeding plumage aspect. There were other starlings at the, whoops, sorry about that. There we go. Uh, there were other starlings at the Walmart uh, this morning, like this fellow. Actually, is it a fellow? I'm going to argue that this is not a fellow. We're going to take a look at the base of this bird's bill, which has this sort of uh, pinkish tint to it, and that makes this starling a female European starling. The question of males and females and whether we can e-bird them is absolutely relevant to the whole matter of e-birding. We can e-bird males and females, and we'll look at how to do that a little bit later on. So if female starlings have pink at the base of their bill. Wouldn't it just be perfect if male starlings, like this one in the Walmart parking lot, had blue at the base of their bills? And in fact, they do. So this is a male starling. And again, just to put things uh, in perspective, every single image that we're looking at is from the Walmart parking lot, this morning, excuse me, something just happened here. Move that off the side. Uh, in Lafayette here. So we're looking at a, uh, here a fairly glossy European, male European starling, one that has come uh, well along into its breeding plumage aspect. All right, so we've looked at starlings. If there are starlings in the Walmart parking lot, you'd better be sure that there are also, whoops, sorry, I am having one technical difficulty after another. There we go. Um, hopefully, it says my screen sharing is paused. Am I still visible to you all? Am I out there? Yes, yes, Ted, we can oh, see it. Super, okay. Yeah, the problem is since I can't see anybody out there, I can't tell what's going on, but so be it. All righty, so um, here is a, a pigeon um, that was at the Walmart this morning. Um, I wanna say two things about this pigeon. The first thing I wanna say is that this is a really beautiful bird. If the rock pigeon were a- um, We can't less... see the pigeon. We're still looking at the male starling. That's interesting. Why is that? It says screen sharing is paused. Um, hmm. Resume share. How about that? Is that a rock That's pigeon? That's it. Yep, All you right. got it. Thank you much. Okay, we were looking at a rock pigeon. And the uh, two points, the first point I wanted to make was that this is a really, really beautiful bird. If this were a Swainson's warbler or a Henslow sparrow, gonna nod to my friends out in the east there. This is the sort of bird you would pay really good money to look at. It's just that it's beautiful with those uh, lime and sort of uh, vinaceous tints there and just sort of an elegant bird overall. And look at that spectacularly brilliantly sort of a uh, orange red either. It looks like one of those pyracantha berries that you see around Christmas. So it's a beautiful bird. That's the first point I want to make. Um, the second point I want to make though is that it's got something in its mouth. It's got a pine needle in its mouth and this bird is in fact working on a nest. Uh, if we look directly above us, we're still in the uh, eaves of our Walmart here. Uh, that is the nest of our rock pigeon. And nesting behavior by birds is something that we can, and in fact, in a moment, will be documenting via eBird. 
We're going to take another look at a different pigeon. Uh, and that owl at Walmart is really having some difficulties today. The uh, starling has um, gone away, but we've got a pigeon up on top of it. One point I want to make here real quickly is that this pigeon does not look the same as the pigeon we saw a moment ago. It's a much darker bird. It doesn't have the, uh, the big broad wing bars as well. So uh, based on plumage, we can often tell how many different birds we have out there. So this is a different rock pigeon. A moment uh, later, a starling appeared uh, beneath the rock pigeon and then another starling appeared beneath it. And I know the question you all are wondering now, can we sex these starlings? So there's our female with the pink at the base of the bill. There's our male with the blue at the base of the bill. So this is a pair of starlings. And I also want to bring to your attention the fact that the uh, so-called upper mandible or maxilla of this starling is overlong. This bird is probably expressing what we call uh, incipient avian keratin disorder. And making notes like this and photo documenting it is a very, very important part of being a a birder and an amateur ornithologist and being an e-bird, e-birder. Okay, so if our um, owl is having a bad day with starlings and with pigeons, what could be worse than getting an entire full-on common raven to perch on top of you? Um, this owl is probably having the worst day in the history of plastic owls. Uh, but this bird, this common raven, was on top of our owl at the Walmart a little bit earlier today. Um, this bird um, flew a very short distance, actually even closer to me, and landed on a light post right there in the Walmart parking lot. And what I want to bring to your attention on this common raven in the parking lot is there's something about its eye that is just a little bit curious. It seems to be half blue and half black. So common ravens, completely unlike humans and some birds like owls, do not blink their eyes in a... Um, in a uh, vertical sort of uh, Venetian blind-like uh, motion. Instead, they wipe across their eye in a horizontal motion like windshield wipers, something called their nictitating membrane or um, nictitans. And you can see this bird in mid-swipe right now, which is so cool. Our human eyes are not fast enough to see this. We can see eyes, a uh, bird's eyes sort of uh, shining or flashing, sort of going um, from one color to another, but getting the bird in mid swipe like this is something that you will see only with a camera. Um, just to prove to you that the bird doesn't always look like that, here it is a second later, and now you can see that its eye is wide open. Okay, um, our raven didn't just stand there. He stood up, and as you can see, he seems to be in mid-croak. And I think I've got audio. Let's see if this works. <laughs> if Elena Claver is out, no, I'm joking, but I would ask her to do an imitation of this bird's uh, so. oh, There we go. <laughs> Okay, so we're obviously listening to the croaking, thank you, Elena, if that was you, um, the, uh, the croaking of a common raven at the Walmart parking lot. And just like these photos from this morning, that audio was also obtained this morning. Ravens have diverse vocalizations, but that sort of classic croak, 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 or the croak, 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 croak is a, um, it's an all-purpose solicitation call. It's a basically a way of a raven saying to another raven, hey, I'm here, what's going on? Let's get our act together here. Uh, in fact, actually, that call I just played for you wasn't really from this particular raven. This raven, I couldn't get the recorder up on a time, I just got the camera. That call actually came from this nearby raven, uh, this is the bird that gave the call that we just heard. Um, this bird is back in the uh, the Walmart uh, super center infrastructure here. And you see those spiky things there that are supposed to keep birds away. It doesn't seem to work uh, very well. To put things in perspective, here is an image of the Walmart looking up to the tippy tippy top of our Walmart. And what we're gonna pay attention to is something going on right in this part of the Walmart. So both of the ravens after that croak, 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 uh, got together here. One bird came out of here and another left. And what I discovered this morning is that they're nesting right there at the pinnacle, the summit, the main primary entrance with all of those hundreds or thousands of shoppers going in there. By the way, those are the uh, tail feathers of one of the, uh, the ravens there. I just think it's so cool that there were so many shoppers there this morning. And as far as I know, not a one of them knew that common ravens were nesting right above them. The common raven is one of the greatest birds on earth. It is by far the largest passerine on the planet. It is greater in all 
um, major morphometric measurements than the red-tailed hawk, which is a very large raptor. It's longer from tail tip to bill tip. It has a longer wingspan and it weighs considerably more than a red-tailed hawk. And I found this morning that there are common ravens nesting right atop, actually right underneath the top of the Walmart in Lafayette. Let me take a swig of water here. And actually at this point, um, Sue or Nick, if there are any questions of sort of a general note, um, I'll be happy to take them. If there are specific questions, I think we'll probably wait till the end, but I'm just wondering if anybody wanted to um, ask a question, if there was a question in the chat of a general note that I might field now. If not, that's fine, but if so, I'm happy to entertain a question. Nothing on, on chat at the moment. Okay, great. So folks, again, just um, keep piling on those chat qu qu questions, um, especially later on when we get into some of the more technical stuff. Um, we're going to continue, but thanks again for that, Nick. We're going to continue just with the bird watching, a little bit more bird watching, then we're going to build an eBird checklist out of our experience this morning. So the common raven, I just need to say for uh, folks who are perhaps not from um, the front range region of Colorado, is a bird that if you live in a place where there aren't ravens, I mean, it's one of the great iconic birds. Ravens are awesome and there are large swaths of the United States and of course the rest of the world where there aren't ravens. And I just think it's really, really neat to be able to find common ravens, the biggest passerine on earth by far nesting in the Walmart Super Center in Lafayette. Okay, there are two general questions. Two general questions. Oops, um, okay, I don't know how to go backwards. So that, that's a magpie, but let's take the general questions now. <laughs> One is uh, what what did you use to to uh, record audio and what did you use to take today's photos? Yeah, thanks for both of those questions. Um, at the end, when I can see myself again and you can see me, I'm actually going to hold up my gadgets uh, so that you all can maybe even make screen captures of it. The real short answer is that I use a point and shoot camera uh, by Canon called the SX70, and I'll give you all the exact specs on that later on. And then I use an Olympus uh, handheld recorder. It's actually smaller than a cell phone, and that's called the LS10. I know I went through that really, really fast, but I will repeat all of that, and I'll do so more slowly at the end. And what app was used for the weather report? <laughs> Whatever was on my phone. Let me take a look here. That was, um, I just used Yahoo Weather. Um, and I, I just needed a basic, um, really just, just basic uh, information for the weather there. Okay, um, are we ready to go on? Yes. Cool, thanks, Nick. All right, so um, we've gone from one awesome Corvid, the common raven, to another awesome Corvid, the black-billed magpie. And again, easy to take these for granted in Colorado. In fact, um, this bird is the, um, the logo bird of Colorado field ornithologists. And I just had need to uh, briefly go on a, a soapbox here and say that that is a marvelous logo bird. We don't have the best state bird, the lark budding, but if I had my druthers, we would absolutely make the black-billed magpie the state bird of Colorado. It's everywhere in Colorado, in mountaintops and deserts and way out on the Eastern Plains and far out in the Western part of the state. I wish that the black-billed magpie were our state bird, but at least it's Colorado field ornithologist birds, and I suppose that's worth something, is it not indeed? Okay, here is a black-billed magpie, and we're going to take a closer look at the black-billed magpie and see that he's got something in his mouth there, doesn't he? That, or he or she. Uh, this is a nest-building black-billed magpie. I mentioned earlier that nest-building is something that we can uh, use um, to put to good use with eBird, and this bird carried its stick over to a nest that it was building. Magpie nests are curious. If you don't know what they look like, you can easily never notice a magpie nest, but once you know what to look for, they're whoppingly obvious. So magpies build these immense structures. They're sort of a globular clusters of twigs here. Um, for those of you who know the Walmart, we're now about 150 feet south of the Walmart at the um, car wash at the uh, Conoco, uh, just uh, south of Walmart, a little bit closer to, uh, to Baseline Road there. So uh, this is the nest that our magpie was working on. And as I was watching this nest, I heard a commotion behind me and um, actually wound up taking a look at the, uh, the, the dumpster behind the, um, the car wash right there. And I don't know, maybe Weston Barker can tell that there's actually a bird in there. Well, I did something I, didn't, I don't do very often in the course of birding, but um, well, the things I do for you people, I actually had to do some dumpster diving to get the perfect picture of this black-billed magpie in the dumpster. What I'm most struck about by this um, scene here isn't the magpie, although magpies are very cool. 
But what kind of person would throw out a perfectly good serving of mozzarella sticks with dipping sauce? I can't believe that. I could imagine doing that with my quinoa or my sprouts or maybe even my kombucha or something, but who could possibly discard all of those scrumptious looking caloric and fatty and not good for you, but very good, tasty um, mozzarella sticks with dipping sauce. Well, the magpie um, was all about these um, dipping sticks. And I'm gonna show you now an extremely short video. Uh, Nick and I tried this out a little bit uh, earlier this evening and I couldn't get it to run really, really smoothly. And I think it, although I um, maxed out the, um, the, um, uh, the compatibility for, for sh sh running video, and I brought it all the way down to four seconds. It's going to be jumpy, but the only point I want to make here, because we're going to see this with a vengeance when we get to our eBird checklist, is that you can make videos and you can upload them to your checklist. So here goes. There is our magpie, and let's see if we can. Oh, it's sort of <laughs> But our magpie um, is going to town there on our uh, mozzarella sticks with dipping sauce. All right, so we've made a video. Uh, when we get onto my eBird checklist, I'm gonna show you guys how to do that a little bit later on here. Uh, that video should run very, very smoothly. In fact, uh, eBird does an excellent job of bringing in these videos and um, buffering them and running them very, very nicely. As all of this action was going on in the dumpster, and I was really sorely tempted to get on those mozzarella sticks, but I didn't, um, something caught the corner out my eye and uh, there was a bald eagle flying over overhead. I had a hunch for where it was heading. If you know this Walmart over in the north side of the Walmart, there's a huge dead cottonwood that often supports a bald eagle or two. We've got bald eagles. We've got ravens. We've got magpies. This is like wild kingdom at Walmart uh, this morning. And this bird uh, stayed up there um, actually for about half an hour and quite a number of shoppers paused to look at the eagle. The fact that I was pointing a camera at it may have had something to do with it. But I thought it was really, really cool that all these people just out shopping on a Sunday morning at least paused to watch a bald eagle. And one more bird and then we're going to talk about building an eBird checklist. If everybody watched this bald eagle, you can be certain that probably nobody looked at this bush tit. This little bush tit, this is a female, we can tell that because she's got the uh, yellow iris right there, uh, was also in some of the shrubbery along the edge of the, um, the Walmart. The bush tit, I think some of you all know, especially those of you from Colorado, is, well, it's really my favorite bird. It's my favorite bird on earth. I could give an entire Zoom presentation on the bush tit. I'm tempted to, but Nick and Sue would kick me off, so I, I won't do that. But I do just want to say uh, two quick things about the bush tit. Uh, the first is that they're so small and just nobody notices them. Uh, the bush tit, and here's a little bit of a um, virtual cocktail party trivia for you. It's actually the smallest passerine in North America, north of Mexico. Um, a couple of our hummingbirds are smaller, but actually many of our hummingbirds are bigger uh, than the bush tit. This bird is actually smaller than the golden crowned kinglet. It is our smallest passerine, which is just such an amazing uh, fact to me. This active little bird is our smallest bird. Um, the other thing about the bush tit, that, and this is really the more sort of important part, and this is where eBird comes into play, is that it is rapidly expanding into northeastern Colorado, in fact, uh, well into southeastern uh, Wyoming now, and I suspect the Nebraska Panhandle will get their first, uh, the state's first bush tit probably any day right now. Bush tits are drastically and rapidly and impressively colonizing uh, the entire Front Range metro region out onto the plains, as I said, up to um, uh, regularly up to Cheyenne and even up to Casper now in Wyoming, uh, and I think they're going to be in the Black Hills of um, South Dakota and certainly the, um, the panhandle of uh, Nebraska. Maybe Steve Laudanoff has found one there already um, before too long. So documenting range expansions is something, as we'll see in a moment, that we can certainly do with eBird. All right. We've, we're done with our birding outing. Now we're going to compile an eBird checklist, and this is going to be the part where I think we're going to get into the uh, sort of the, uh, the nitty gritty of how to do eBird. But again, I'm going to look at big picture items as we go through here. I'm not going to do the, uh, you know, log on to e, uh, eBird.org and enter your name. We're going to skip all of that. It's very, very easy to use that site. And if anybody has questions, we could uh, sort of uh, field those one on one at the end here. Um, as I said, we are about to move into the major part of the presentation, which is the eBird checklist itself. Um, Nick or Sue, if there's maybe an urgent question now, I'll field it. If not, I'll move along. Is there another question? I think there was. Um, let's see where to go here. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, um, what is it? Okay. So, uh, Elena Claver says, I tried to upload a video to an eBird list because I was in Llewellyn, Nebraska, and saw and videoed a 
Coot, which came up as rare. I couldn't upload video. I noted on the list under Coot that if the reviewer wanted the video, I could send it to him or her, but what is best practice for that? Yep, okay. So the short answer to that is if you can't get the video uploaded, and that's often the case, um, I would definitely create an external link in the comment section to wherever that video happens to reside. So if you've got it on some other site, if you've posted it to social media, perhaps, um, if you have it on your own website, just create the, uh, the link to it. But if you can't get the video, yes, you could send it to the reviewer, but I think a better suggestion would be to put it on some third party site and just build a link in the comment section because you can comment on anything. Okay, uh, thanks, Nick, and thanks, Elena. Okay, um, we're gonna shift gears quite abruptly now and um, take this experience that we've just had, this experience of birding at the Walmart parking lot and see what the eBird checklist looks like. So here is the beginning of our eBird checklist from this morning. And the very first thing I'm gonna do is um, get rid of the species. So if everything, um, if everything is working right here, what you all see is an eBird checklist that doesn't have any birds on it. It just has a lot of information. And I do wanna dwell on this point for a moment here because this is really, really, really critical. I wanna be as blunt about this as possible. An eBird checklist without comments is, wait for it, useless. You absolutely have to have the context. What if somebody 50 or 75 years from now wants to reference this checklist? Maybe there's not even a Walmart there anymore. Maybe they don't have Walmarts anymore. You wanna be able to know what happened um, at this point in space and time, and you're writing for the future. You're also perhaps writing for somebody in, I saw Pennsylvania, and I saw Virginia, and I saw Maine, and I saw North Carolina. So please, please, please go crazy with the comments. And again, I just want to say that an eBird checklist without comments is almost useless. Um, look also across the top here. I just want to note that um, we've got a full enumeration of what was out there. We saw 23 species, uh, five other taxa. We'll see as we go along here what is meant by that. Those are basically birds that can't be um, specifically identified as one species or another, and about 153 individuals overall. 11 of these were supported by photos, four with audio, and three with video. Now we're going to bring back the checklist here. And what we're going to do is go through the uh, checklist bird by bird. There are going to be 23 of them all together. And we'll just sort of highlight a few here and see what's going on with our checklist. Um, the first thing to note here, and this is just the beginning of the checklist. And uh, for those of you all who aren't familiar with the checklist sequence, the birds don't appear in alphabetical order or they're not ordered by size or color. Um, they're ordered according to um, relationships uh, that are best understanding of evolutionary relationships. So we put evolutionarily close birds, like for example, Canada geese and cackling geese together in the same part of the checklist. As we scroll through the checklist, I think this will become um, pretty obvious what's going on here. Um, I have a photo of the Canada geese there. And the one thing I want to notice about the, can the, the photo here, it's not a great photo at all. That's not the point. You can actually count the 24 Canada geese in this image. If you're bored and want something to do, see if you can count the 24 geese in that image. People often ask me the question, how did you know there were 24 or 124 or 324 birds in the flock? And increasingly what I'm finding is I'm just taking a picture and counting them. You can easily see the 24 different birds uh, in the flock. eBird, in addition to um, properly and understandably um, querying rare birds also queries high counts of birds. And there's nothing better, in my opinion, than taking a picture of the flock and showing every single individual in the flock. Um, something else I want to point out here is that we have notes for every single bird here, our cackling goose, our Canada goose, our um, Canada goose of a particular subspecies, then our unidentified or combination goose here, cackling slash Canada. Um, I went kind of fast and I made a few mistakes. There are some typos here. I spelled homogeneous wrong. And I should have said birds plural there. If you can see, I've just made the correction there. I'm joking, of course. I'll go back in and fix it. But please, folks, don't worry about this. I'm going to pick on Weston because I know he's in the audience here again. Weston, by the way, is a superb speller. But um, I'm really gratified that some of the younger um, birders and ornithologists are really going um, crazy with the, uh, the comments. And as a reviewer myself, I really don't care if you make really egregious spelling mistakes. I made some myself here. And what I really want to see is your comments. And if they're stream of consciousness, if they're free form, if they're all over the place in terms of grammar and syntax, that's cool. I don't mind. I just want to see your comments. All right. From the geese, let's go down to the uh, next group of birds, which are going to be the um, 
uh, pigeons and doves and then the beginning of the raptors. So we've got our rock pigeon here and I have some notes on the rock pigeon and note that I have something up there called the breeding code. This bird is NB or nest building because I saw that it was building a nest. So eBird allows you to indicate what your bird was doing. In this case, it was building a nest. I didn't type in NB nest building confirmed like that. That's a, um, a field that I went into called breeding code and then I entered that code and it appears as is. Under collar dove, I just noticed that there were widespread songsters. And then for bald eagle, look at what's going on here. I indicated that the bird was, oh, I made a mistake. It's not an adult male. It's actually an adult and the sex is unknown. I just caught that. Okay, folks, we'll fix that at the end there. This is not necessarily an adult male bald eagle. This is an adult of sex unknown. So an error has been made here. That does happen. And uh, this is a very uh, useful teachable moment. We're going to see a little bit later on here just of uh, what goes on when we make mistakes like this. Anyhow, that is an adult bald eagle, sex unknown. And there's the photo at the bottom of our bald eagle. Continuing with the raptors, uh, we see that there was a red-tailed hawk and then we get down into the woodpeckers. Um, comment about this photo of the red-tailed hawk here. And I, there I do have this correctly identified. There were three, yes, adults of unknown sex here. This is a terrible photograph. It's a one-star photograph. And I'm ambivalent about putting photos this bad in eBird. Um, for demonstration purposes, as you can see, I put it there for CFO discussion. It's a terrible one-star photo. I don't see any value in contributing really bad photos of common birds. Now, if this had been a great black hawk, yeah, I'd like to have seen the photo um, even at this level because the uh, Colorado Bird Records Committee would probably be very interested in it. But except for the fact that I'm doing a demo for you all, I probably would not have uploaded that photo. I think it's just too poor a photo. All righty, every Colorado um, eBird checklist is, almost every Colorado eBird checklist is gonna have flickers. And if I have, um, my little soapbox to subject you all to here. It's, um, oh, a red line appeared on my screen there. Um, I have no idea how that happened. I've been taking, maybe I'm being Zoom bombed, wow. Um, anyhow, uh, Northern Flickers are fantastically complicated in Colorado. I saw this bird down here that I, I, I really don't know what it was. It's a flicker, that's for sure. I don't think it's a, um, a pure bird because it's got some yellow in the tail there, but otherwise that's a yellow shafted character, uh, but otherwise it has sort of a red shafted face. I don't think it's an adult, but I'm not really sure of that either. This bird was singing like crazy. It was drumming like crazy. And I just don't know what it is. So I documented it with a photo and with video and maybe Tony Lukering or somebody will come in and tell us what this bird is. Um, I also noted in passing here that one of the birds was an obvious hybrid. Um, we can to some extent tell what generation hybrid our flickers are here. I can just tell you that it didn't, because it was a male, it did not look like a first generation or F one hybrid. So um, lots of cool complexity to put in here. And our flicker here is one that um, I don't really understand, but we'll have to take a look at a little bit later on. Okay, from the flickers, we're going to go now into the uh, kestrels and then finally the passerine. So I saw one adult male uh, kestrel flying over and that is correctly entered there. It's an adult male. Um, and that we're into the uh, the corvids now. Just a quick note about the blue jays, and then quite a bit here on the um, the magpies. So you see the um, images that I showed you earlier, uh, the video, and then a few other images um, that I didn't actually show you during the bird watching part of the presentation. So um, a breeding code was entered here, and I just made a note uh, that I documented apparently two different uh, nest building efforts by these magpies here, and also some dumpster diving by the magpies and a crow flying over. Uh, continuing with the corvids, uh, we come now to our raven. And again, these images ought to look familiar to you. I showed you the uh, raven up on the owl and then the raven on the light post. Um, and also the um, on the far right panel there, uh, that's the sound spectrogram of our um, of our common raven there. I saw that uh, Nick, I uh, saw Nick Comer, that Nathan Peeplow is speaking to us next month. I thought it was the 25th, but maybe it's the 24th. I'm not actually sure about that. Um, I'm not gonna say much about spectrograms as much as I would love to talk about spectrograms because Nathan will do that, I suspect, uh, next month. But uh, look at those beautiful stacked partials and overtones and nasality and all that other stuff that Nathan Peeplow will be uh, um tickling your fancy with uh, next year. So that's the um, the spectrogram. And I can't do this now because it's a static image, but um, in a real eBird checklist, we could click on that blue arrow and listen to the sounds and then watch the scrolling spectrogram, which is a fantastic way to learn bird songs. Again, I think Nathan will be doing that for you next year. Um, I recorded that um, 
Raven under fairly trying conditions in terms of ambient noise. There was a lot of it, I'll just say that. Uh, the chickadees that I recorded were actually in a much quieter, I mean, quiet is relative at the Walmart, a relatively quiet environment. And you can see um, spectacular spectrographic detail there. Again, we're not gonna press the blue arrow because I can't, but you can press the blue arrow. Um, actually, it's, I guess a white arrow and a blue background there and listen to these songs. And you know, chickadees are the cute little chickadees that go chickadee, dee, dee, dee. But I hope what you can also see there is a tremendous amount of complexity in these birds' vocalizations. And you can see, especially on the left, they're just all the different things that this chickadee is saying, and then more um, also over on the right. And this is just the beginning, by the way, of fairly long cuts of these chickadees. So along with the uh, photos and along with the video, we can upload sounds, and then we can click on the sounds, excuse me, the icons for the sounds, uh, watch the spectrogram scroll, listen to the sound, and learn so much about bird vocalizations. There's a After, couple of questions right now, Ted. Okay, Seems let's like, take a question or two, sure. Yeah, it says, uh, for birds that don't have what I call a song, like flickers, does one use X or S to donate, to uh, denote a song? And that's from Alinda. Right, so um, that actually is, believe it or not, the song. Uh, both the drumming and the wick, 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 those constitute song. They may not sound like the beautiful song of a thrush or a... Uh, I think magpies are beautiful, but uh, that does constitute song. So um, a woodpecker drumming and certainly a woodpecker going wick, 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 wick. Those both count as song. So you can call those song. Okay, another question. What program do you use to get a spectrogram? And that's from Elena. Okay, so um, every spectrogram I have shown you is actually eBird generated. So these are made in house by um, the Macaulay uh, Library in Ithaca. So I didn't use any program to generate these. When you upload your audio to eBird, a spectrogram is made for you automatically. I think, although I could be wrong here, and if there's somebody in Ithaca, they can correct me. They must be using Raven or one of the Raven derivatives to make these spectrograms. But the spectrograms, and we see three on this page here, one of the Raven going crook, 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 and then the chickadee doing a whole bunch of different things. I did not make those. The, um, the computer output made those. Um, However, okay, well, that said, I do make my own spectrograms. I use Audacity to do that. But for our purposes, for making an eBird checklist, you don't have to worry about that. Um, eBird will do it for you. Okay, another question. Okay. Um, so how is an observation in eBird confirmed? That's from Kevin. Right, okay. So it's a two-part process. And again, we're, we're gonna get toward, toward that in the end, but um, if the bird is um, of expected occurrence, in time and space and also the number of occurrences, it just gets in. So I didn't see a single rare bird today. Birds like ravens and chickadees are just accepted because they occur here and there's nothing exceptional about seeing common ravens or black capped chickadees. However, if I had um, found a Chihuahuan raven or a Carolina chickadee, birds that don't occur, or not supposed to occur in Lafayette, then the bird uh, sits in a queue where uh, expert human reviewers evaluate the record, ideally based on photos and um, other media, uh, and also importantly on written uh, documentation as well. And if it passes muster with the reviewer community, then it goes into the main public database. So yeah, we have not looked at a single rare bird today. So all of these sightings would go into the database anyhow. Uh, but if it had been, again, a Chihuahuan raven or a Carolina chickadee, a human being would need to vet that record. Okay, one more question for now, Ted. Okay. Uh, how do you actually upload the photos sounds and typed info and that's from lucy right so assuming we're okay but you can't do it from your phone so you have to go back home and do it on your laptop so that's um, a critical point here but well, when you're back on your laptop uh there's a me uh, uh, a field that's called that just says add media and then it takes you to a whole universe of possibilities for uploading um, your images. By the way, I should say you can't upload it easily from your phone. I, let me let me clarify that right there. Um, you actually can. Um, there are all sorts of web-based ways for doing it from your phone. But and we're going to see this toward the end here. I urge you not to do that. I really think you should upload the images after you've had a chance to review them on your laptop. They look a lot better, and you can do things with them before you get them uploaded. Thank you. Okay, um, we got a little bit more of this checklist, although we're approaching uh, the end here. Um, we are now in the bush tits, and there are two photos of the female bush tit there. Uh, you can also see uh, her vocalization 
of those two sm smudges at the beginning and then the male farther back out there. It's not much to listen to, but there's actually a lot of spectrographic information in there, which I think is cool. You can see our starlings there. Um, and although we didn't talk much about a house finch, I just want to point out that all three media types, a photo and then a video, uh, and then the song of the house finch are all presented down there. So um, back to the question about um, how does the information get validated? You know, the house finch is a very, very, very common bird, and there's nothing exceptional about 17 house finches. But if I had documented, let's say, 17 purple finches, um, it would have been exceptionally valuable to have had a photo, a video, and uh, audio of the bird. Um, so the more... Um, uh, documentary and information that you can provide to the reviewer community, the better. And not just the reviewer community, all of us. I like to know um, why it is that uh, what the European starlings were doing, or that they were uh, occupying nest, or that the bush tit was a female, or that the robins were widespread. That's in useful information for all of us, not just for the reviewers. Um, we're going to just wrap up our checklist now here. Whoops. Um, oh, oh, look, there's a little typo in there. <laughs> typo fixed. And um, here's the end of our checklist right here. And just a point that um, uh, no, no photos of any of these, but just notes about each one of them. And some of them are just very, very basic notes here, but I do think it's useful um, just to say a little bit about what your bird was doing. Okay, so we have gone all the way through an entire eBird checklist. I know I went through it fast and furious, but I did just want to give a sense for what a thorough and complete eBird checklist looks like. Uh, that is the experience of eBirding right there. We're at a sort of major break point. Actually, we're beginning to wind up here now, but I'm going to start to conclude the presentation with some um, sort of uh, best practices and tips for all of us who are eBirders. Sue, if there's a question, this would be a good time for a break. I'm going to take a swig of water anyhow, and if not, we'll move along. Yes, there's a question. Okay. And this is from Lilla. She says, when uploading a photo and without a high powered lens, is it best to upload a photo at distance that clearly shows the bird, like a horn grebe that she saw today in Fort Collins, or to crop and submit photo at closer range but with far less resolution. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, there actually is guidance for that um, at the eBird website. And I'm a little reluctant to give you my personal opinion because you probably ought to go to the eBird website <laughs> and see what um, they say. But they give some really nice guidance about basically, yes, um, having the uh, bird fairly large in the screen. And there's some other um, points of guidance that they provide as well there. Um, now, that said, a bird that's just um, in the image and small can, of course, be blown up by anybody to uh, um, achieve full screen or you know, full in the frame um, uh, stature anyhow. So I don't think it matters too terribly much. I would not blow up an image to the point that you can't even see what it is. So if it starts to look pixelated, you're not doing anybody any good at all. Uh, my images, as you probably saw, are fairly uh, large in the frame. I do think that's the most useful way to upload images. Okay, and Tanya asks, Will the reviewers not be exasperated if all of us start to add comments to every single observation? <laughs> I think the reviewers will be delighted. The reviewers don't have to read these, by the way. Um, and that's and thank you, Tanya. That question's a great segue to um, the next part of the presentation, which I'm going to actually take us into right now. So um, we're going to look now at. Um, by the way, does everybody see that bizarre red line on the side of my screen on the left there? I have no idea where that came from, but so be it. Um, we're going to look at five ways to be a better eBirder. Remember at the beginning I said that um, we're going to wipe the slate clean and whether you've been doing this for a long, long time or whether you just started, um, I'd like sort of us all to be in the, uh, the same boat. Well, that's going to be the case here because we're going to be examining um, five ways to be a better eBirder. If you're brand new, do these things. If you've been doing it for a long time, maybe consider learning these for the first time. All righty. Um, oh, we're going to do this in... Um, decreasing order of importance. So we're going to look at the least important of these five ways to be a better eBirder and then work our way up closer and closer to the most important way to be a better eBirder. So the first one, and some of you all have actually touched on this with your questions already, is to be careful, be thorough, be accurate, be precise. Um, and I noticed that uh, in most instances, not all, but most instances, a complete checklist, the one that indicate all the birds that you saw, not just the cool birds like the bald eagle and the bush tit, but also the starlings and the rock pigeons are the ones that are useful for analysis of the data. Um, we've already seen that I made at least one mistake. Remember that bald eagle? It was uh, not an adult male. It was an adult sex unidentified. And I urge everybody, especially if you're doing this with eBird Mobile, to check your checklist again when you get back home. The number of just 
I'm not talking about identification mistakes, but just basic accounting mistakes that I see on almost a checklist by checklist basis, not just myself, but pretty much all the rest of you is astonishing. Just go back and check your checklist. It's incredible how many times we just accidentally make a mistake. We put in morning dove when we met white wing dove or vice versa. So be careful, be thorough, be accurate, be precise. And actually this is the least important of the five ways to be a better eBurger. Um, next up, and I've already alluded to this, is to double check your checklists for simple user error. And especially if you use eBird Mobile. When you're in the field and worse yet, maybe birding from your car while driving and tapping in an eBird checklist, you make so many mistakes. The following sounds facetious, but it isn't. I rarely find a checklist uploaded on the mobile app that doesn't have a mistake on it. So just go back home and check your checklist again. There are so many mistakes and some of them are sort of comical in the same way that I would hope you would, I don't know, proofread a paper you were gonna submit or something like that, double check that checklist. And again, I'm talking about just simple user error, not bird identification mistakes, not differences of opinion, not uh, all the subjective vagaries of identifying birds in the field. I'm just talking about clerical errors that we all make. In fact, we've seen several on my checklist already. Okay, moving up in level of importance is uh, to upload media. These are the photos, the audio, as I said, even video. The video functionality of eBird is still emerging. It's sort of um, uneven right now, but it's getting better and there should be a uh, sort of full launch of this uh, very soon. And I wanna point out that uh, uh, media of common species, I said common but confusing, are especially welcome. That flicker that I just didn't really know how to identify. It's, it's a Northern flicker, but I don't know what sex or age or even what subspecies or perhaps combination of subspecies it is. Those are great photos. And the Macaulay Library is becoming a uh, incredibly valuable resource of uh, properly archived and powerfully searchable photos of birds, photos and audio and video of birds from all over the planet. Um, Yes, upload your common, common birds. The eBird database can absolutely accommodate your house sparrows and European starlings and rock pigeons. And those are great birds to document, by the way, because the um, uh, variation in their appearances and in their vocalizations are quite complex. As I said earlier, I'm um, ambivalent at best about really, really crappy photos. I, oh, somebody's chatting. If they could turn the uh, audio off, that'd be great. Um, yeah, would you mute that? <laughs> we need a mute back there. All right, thanks. Um, so upload everything, including your house sparrows, including your European starlings, including your rock pigeons, but don't put in just crapola photos unless they're rare birds. So upload media, go wild, go wild with common species, be judicious about really poor photos. All right. The uh, second to most important comment, and I've already made this comment already, is that you want to enter comments. Uh, in particular, those that are um, emphasizing um, description, so what the bird looks like in the context uh, of the sighting. And um, I said this earlier, but write for someone who's not there, write for somebody in the future. eBird is really valuable. I know mo most of us are in Colorado here, but for those of you all who are in Virginia and Maine and Pennsylvania, you know, Y'all are real people too. And we in Colorado need to make sure that we're writing for you folks as well. Maybe you're not gonna rush out here to see our house sparrows and our European starlings, but y'all are legitimate users of eBird. And when we in Colorado, create such checklists, we need to do so for everybody. Similarly, for those of you back East who have a tufted tit mice and uh, exciting fish crows and other birds like that, you know, remember that we in Colorado would like to learn a little bit about that. So enter those comments, they are so valuable. All righty. So here are the, uh, the most important ways, five, four, three, and two, to be a better eBirder. I know everybody's waiting with bated breath for what the most important way to be a better eBirder is. So the first four are all, um, I guess I would say along the lines of like, just, you know, kind of common sense and common courtesy, being careful, slowing down, trying to minimize mistakes, being thorough. I think number one is the one that's gonna uh, maybe throw some of us um, for a, a loop. It's one that I see um, mistakenly applied almost everywhere I go. So the most important thing that you can do as an eBirder is to upload checklists from places where nobody else goes birding, ag fields, pine woods, even Walmarts. The eBird database is incredibly robust to an awful lot of mistakes. 
But the biggest problem with the eBird uh, database is that it is massively biased toward rare birds and to places in the landscape that have lots and lots of birds in them. The following is not facetious. It's, I'm telling you all the truth. If we wanted to make the eBird database in Colorado better, we would not go to Chico Basin and Chatfield State Park and Cherry Creek State Park so often. Instead, we'd be spending a lot more time in Walmarts because that's where the birds are and very importantly, where the birds are not. I love birding up in the Ward area in uh, the Western uh, foothills of Boulder County. Um, you can find large numbers of really exciting birds all at one feeder there. But it's also really important when you're up in Ward to get out in the pine forest where there's nothing but mountain chickadees and common ravens, if that. Those checklists are very, very, very valuable. And if we have an eBird database that only has lots and lots of high concentrations of sometimes really, really rare birds, that gives policymakers and the people who implement policy a, a very false impression of the rarity and the scarcity, unfortunately, of so many birds, so many places in the landscape. So in complete seriousness, yes, eBird wants checklists from your local parks, from your backyards, and even from shopping centers. Um, I wanted to just take a very quick whirlwind tour now here of um, some exciting places to go birding throughout uh, Colorado here in Jefferson, Arapaho, Mesa, Alamosa, El Paso, and Route counties wanted to sort of spread the wealth. Here's a great place to go birding in Jefferson County. Here's a great place to go birding in Arapaho County. There's a great place to go birding in Mesa County. There's a nice place to go birding in Alamosa County. Here's a fine birding hotspot in El Paso County. And there's a great birding uh, hotspot in Route County. Now, I realize you all are still going to go to Chico Basin and to Cherry Creek and to Chatfield. And by the way, I'll be right there with you. I, I get that. That's totally cool. But I love that saying that you're never not a birder. And when you are going into the Walmart in Jefferson County or Arapahoe County or Mesa County or wherever, enter an eBird checklist. It's really, really valuable. There are lots of starlings and sparrows and pigeons out there, and we need to document their occurrence. If you just can't bring yourself to go shopping at a Walmart, I accept that, but there are lots of other places you can go shopping. I don't know, go to the Whole Foods Shopping Mart uh, in, um, in, in downtown Boulder. There are birds there as well. And also go to those places that are away from uh, areas of human habitat ha habitation, like um, ag fields in winter in the eastern plains or the um, the lonely pine forests in the uh, in the winter months you'll get very few species but you'll be valuably serving the eBird database okay um i'm we really now quick questions oh, two quick questions okay lay yeah. on uh this is from kevin could you explain why it's necessary to add comments to a rare bird when you've got a good or great photos that clearly document the bird yeah, I mean, you don't have to. I'd say your mileage may vary on that one, but I do find that context to be really, really important. If I just go out and see a red-breasted sapsucker, I don't know why that popped into my mind, and just upload the photo, I kind of want some information on that. Um, what was the bird doing? Did you hear it? Um, did anybody else see it? So, um, you know, they say that a picture is worth 10,000 words. Um, okay, but 10,000 words, or maybe not that much, um, are worth a lot too. And if you can write, write with sort of, you know, haiku-like brevity, uh, that context really, really is important. So, um, yes, the photo is very valuable. I don't, and I, but it's just not an either or thing. That context uh, is so important. Uh, consider, for example, the, um, the effect of weather. Um, a lot of us are going to be seeing um, birds in connection with upslope uh, fallouts. I hope we'll be seeing birds in connection with upslope fallouts uh, in the next uh, month and a half to two months ahead. And noting that an upslope system was in progress is incredibly important. Remember, you're writing for somebody maybe 75 years from now. So if you photograph a flock of sagebrush sparrows at Cherry Creek State Park and neglect to mention that there was a historic bomb cyclone in progress, you're missing a really important part of the story. So yes, the photos are great. The audio is wonderful too, but the written context is so important. Okay, another question. Yep. What's the best way of counting large numbers of birds that cannot be uh, caught in a single photograph? Uh, there's sure. an example, 150 plus uh, cormorants at the Denver City Park today with, uh, with their coming and going like a busy airport. Yeah, that's fair. Um, by the way, a photo does help. Um, I have been amazed at how many birds I can count. Um, and you said 150, but I mean, thousands of individual birds and photos of things like uh, red winged blackbirds and bohemian waxwings, but not, not from Colorado. So uh, the photos are excellent. But if you just cannot uh, count the birds because they're just so many of them, they're packed in densely. The 
the advice I want to give here, and I want to give it as strongly as possible, is don't estimate. Human beings in all cultures all across the world and all generations are terrible estimators. Count one, two, three, four, five. It doesn't take that long even to get up to 900 or 950. If the flock is truly immense, if you're in the say five digits or high four digits, instead of counting off by 25s or 50s, and no human has the ability to do that, that's an entirely fictitious ability. It does not exist. I just have real problems with checklists that said I estimated by hundreds. What you want to do is you want to still do a one by one count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, et cetera, all the way up to 100, and then make your best guesses to what fraction of the flock, uh, what fraction of the total flock that was, and then take the reciprocal, and that's your number right there. So if you just see a huge flock of Canada geese, and there might be cackling geese in there as well, but um, still do that one by one count, 90 birds, 100 birds, and then say to yourself, well, that was 10% of the flock, or that was a uh, 2% of the flock, and then do the math and extrapolate outward that way. Okay, one person asks, uh, where's the proper place to add details like weather and Oh, in the, comment, in the comments section right at the beginning there. Okay. Put it all in the comments. Okay. And then are you going to uh, getting into a complete versus an incomplete checklist? Right. So, I, yeah. So uh, that remember, that was point number, uh, was it one or two? Complete checklist. You want to use a complete checklist. Um, the uh, exception there is if you can't um, um, upload a complete checklist. Maybe you just are not familiar enough with the birds of the area. Um, you were rushed and you didn't want to do it. Um, obviously, I don't, don't call it complete if it's not complete. But if you have the time to add those pigeons and starlings and house sparrows and double crested cormorants uh, in, the, in the city park, you really want to include that information. So when you can include or when you can uh, upload a complete checklist, that is desirable. But don't cut corners. And if you just are unfamiliar with the birds of the area and or if you just don't have the time, then of course you call it an incomplete checklist. The incomplete checklists are not used in most of the data modeling uh, by eBird. Okay, and then if you could just talk about putting in numbers versus putting in an X. Right, or okay, um, that's a pet peeve of mine. So um, I love Xs, but um, Macaulay does not love Xs <laughs> because there are often cases in which I just, there's just a big flock of ducks out there, or a big flock of geese out there, or a big flock of uh, sandhill cranes flying over in the dark, and I don't know the numbers. Um, the idea is that you should, the as I understand it correctly, the idea is you should still lowball it to the the best um, estimate that you can, uh, sorry, the best count that you can come up with. Um, I don't use Xs because I'm um, following the directive, but I like the idea of being able to indicate that I didn't know what was out there. But when you put an X in, that actually does funny stuff to your entire checklist, uh, analytically speaking. So one good thing about not using X is it really does um, uh, promote discipline <laughs> uh, for counting birds. There have been cases where I'm like, do I really have to count those Canada geese? And the answer is yes, I really have to count those Canada geese. I've been tempted to use the X there, but I have been uh, pretty much cold turkey on Xs for about a year now. Okay, um, let's move along because um, we can do more Q and A. And thanks for the questions, by the way. Um, as we're almost done here, but I do want to um, take a um, sort of non-Colorado big picture perspective on everything as we prepare to uh, to wind down here. So today is uh, what is today? March twenty eighth, uh, twenty twenty one, and we have just seen the uh, the sort of whole experience of recording birds. Uh, in the third decade now of the 21st century with sound and audio, I sorry, sound and video and cameras and eBird and PowerPoint and Zoom and all sorts of things here. It hasn't always been that way. What we're gonna do now is turn back the clock exactly 35 years to March 28th, 1986. And here's an entry from my uh, field notebook when I was in high school. Uh, again, it's exactly 35 years ago. And you can see that I was in a pine woodland near Gardendale, Alabama. And there was no eBird. I didn't have a camera. They didn't have pocket recorders. They didn't have digital back then. You had to do it the old fashioned way with pen and paper. So I look back upon this checklist, I sorry, it's not even a checklist, it's this enumeration of birds seen in narrative format here. And part of me just sort of smirks at how unbelievably primitive we were uh, 35 years ago. But I also wanna say that the basic approach to documenting what's out there uh, is unchanged. You go out, you go birding. Look, you notice the time from 6.30 to 7.30 this morning in a pine woodland near Gardendale, Alabama. That's, Alabama. That's the beginning of 
the eBird comment section. Now I go into the list here and um, look, they're even in correct um, the phylogenetic sequence of the day. I just noticed that now. So I start with the woodpeckers and wind up with this. The sparrows used to be at the end. They're not anymore. The black and white warbler would go toward the end right now. But in some ways, this is actually not all that dissimilar at all from the experience in the most basic way of e-birding today. Whether we were writing things down in a um, notebook with a blue pen in 1986, or whether we're doing everything with fancy gizmos in the year 2021, there's something fundamentally similar about the experience of watching birds and documenting birds on March 28th, whether it's 1986 or 2021. I could, by the way, um, I'll go in and uh, create an eBird checklist based on what I saw uh, starting at 6.30 in the morning, central day. You know, actually, I'm not sure when they did the daylight savings time thing back then. Anyhow, 6.30 in the morning on March 28th, uh, 1986. I probably would not call this a complete checklist because I can't be sure since I um, did or didn't indicate all the birds here. I'm guessing I'm not seeing grackles and house sparrows and things like that here. Anyhow, I just want to make the point that it's different as this looks from everything that we've done it is kind of similar. I also want to note in passing here that there's more to documenting birds than eBird. Uh, here is just a um, opening spread from an article by Hannah Floyd from a couple of months ago in Birding Mat Magazine on using two programs I haven't talked about at all, iNaturalist and Instagram. I'm not going to go into any detail here because this is an eBird presentation, but if you want to learn more about this, um, you can uh, get the magazine, the article for free at Birding Magazine. You can go to Hannah's um, iNaturalist account at the address shown right there, and you can go to her Instagram account at the address shown right there. Um, I will also say that if you haven't had enough of me um, and other people in my family, um, we're going to be doing more of this in just 40 eight hours. Uh, Hannah Floyd is going to be uh, leading a workshop on iNaturalist. And if you want to learn about iNaturalist and how that might complement your e-birding, uh, I made a tiny URL for you there, right there. It's just nature uh, hyphen challenge hyphen Floyd and watch the case sensitivity there. So um, yes, we have talked about eBird and only about eBird. There are other programs out there and iNaturalist is one that um, could be a presentation unto itself. And I don't know, maybe you guys can get handed to talk to you later this fall about how to use iNaturalist for bird sightings. Um, as we do begin to wind down here, I want to um, acknowledge the support of the American Birding Association in all that I do. I have worked for the ABA now for um, pretty much my entire adult life. And it has been a wonderful ride. It uh, um, has given me a wonderful exposure to people uh, like you all. Uh, the ABA, like Colorado Field Ornithologists, is all about partnerships. It's really gratifying uh, to me during my now, I think 18 years with CFO, about half of those were spent on the board of directors, by the way, uh, that the ABA and the CFO, uh, have, and CFO have been able to do so many wonderful things together. I'm going to wind up now with a... Um, I don't know, a charge for you all, a, a calling. I have something uh, for each one of you to do, or at least consider doing. Something I've not talked about at all is the uh, sort of personal aspect of eBirding. Um, we've been looking at uh, eBird as a corporate resource, something that is valuable to people who perhaps don't live in Colorado at all or who uh, are using the data for reasons that we may not even be able to imagine if we uh, turn the clock forward somewhat. But eBird does present uh, a whole bunch of personal statistics. How many birds you've seen in every county, how many birds you've seen in your life, how many birds you've seen at such and such a point in the year relative to other years. And that's fine. I personally don't really partake. I, I'm not opposed to those statistics. They're just not really uh, something of great personal interest to me. But there is one eBird checklist. Let me get a swig of water here. That is of acute personal interest to me. And it is the, um, the days of consecutive checklist streak. So eBird reports how many days in a row you've gone eBirding. And it looks like there's someone out there who has gone eBirding for 5,000 201 days in a row. If you do the math, that takes us all the way back uh, to January 1st, 2007. And that person, as you may have surmised, is yours truly. I have not missed a day of eBirding in 5,201 days, a substantial chunk of my life. And for those of you all who are much younger than me, that may be even more days than you have been alive. Why on earth do I do this? Well, I suppose part of it is just that sort of a borderline OCD streak in me and so many other bird watchers. But I don't think that's the real reason. I think the real reason is because 
going out every single day and engaging nature and making a note about nature is something that has um, sustained me during a time in life. I started this, by the way, in my 30s, and I'm in my 50s now. That um, has an awful lot going uh, on during it. Um, I've had kids and a home and a spouse and a pandemic and strange elections and all sorts of things out there that have affect me. And I think these things affect you as well. And the idea of going bird watching every single day is something that really has kept me going through a time in life that I think might have been a lot more difficult if it had not been for going e-birding every single day for 5,201 days and counting. And by the way, I intend to do this for the remainder of my time on this earth. I don't know if I'll be able to sustain it, but I don't intend to stop it at any point. Um, here's my challenge to you all, or my charge, or my calling for you. Um, consider starting something like this for yourselves, but not for your whole life or for 5,000 days. How about just doing it for the rest of the year? We are at the end of the uh, first quarter now. So that means we're what, about 90 months, I'm sorry, 90 days uh, into the year. So for just the next 270-ish days or so, see if you can go e-birding or i-natting or otherwise documenting uh, natural things around you all uh, every day without taking a, uh, a break. And to me, really, especially that business of just not taking a break, it is so restorative for me. And it really buoys me when I go out on a day that I just would be cooped up inside the house and maybe just for 10 or 15 minutes, watch the, the chickadees and the co collar doves uh, around my neighborhood. And that's a perfectly valid checklist. In fact, as we've seen, that's an especially high value checklist. Those are the most valuable sorts of checklists of all. So consider e-birding, um, consider doing a lot of e-birding. If you don't want to do eBird, that's acceptable, but consider doing maybe then doing iNaturalist or one of the other crowdsourced uh, uh, resources out there for documenting what you are seeing. I have a final slide for you, and I just wanted to save this for the end because I didn't want you all clicking onto this um, during the presentation, but this is a link to the checklist that I created uh, earlier this evening. Uh, it is case sensitive, so just make sure you get the capital T and the capital F, the hyphen, the capital CFO, and then hyphen eBird there. That checklist is right there for you all to explore. I will fix those handful of mistakes and especially uh, the uh, erroneous bald eagle sighting in there, but if you want to poke around with my checklist and see what I've done, you are absolutely welcome to do so. And that is my checklist. Um, at this point, I'm going to, I think, stop my screen share. Yes, I am, but I'm still here. And um, say that I'm really grateful for all of you all for showing up here this evening. Um, I'm uh, really interested in the questions that we've had so far, and I hope that there will be uh, other questions as well. But I'm done with the uh, slideshow part of the presentation, and I'm happy to um, stay here until I turn into a pumpkin or until Sue and uh, Nick get rid of me. So thanks very much. Good night. And I'd love to hear from you all now. Okay, Ted, there's a couple questions posted. Sure. Uh, they wanted to know about your camera and what oh, right, set, right. setting you have on your camera and the other uh, audio recording gear you used. Okay, so uh, this is, and I, I, you all can see me, right? So yes, um, th this see. is the camera. It's just a dinky little point and shoot. Um, it is the Canon. PowerShot SX70, SX70. Uh, it's got incredible reach. It's got a 1,365 millimeter equivalent lens. That's about um, four and a half feet. It's bigger than I can even show you all here. So the telephoto uh, capability on this is astounding. You can photograph, you know, bush tits on the other side of the well, the other side of the city, practically, that's not quite true. Um, the sensor, of course, is not nearly as good as on a DSL, or, uh, a DSLR lens, but for documenting birds that are out there and getting really quite nice photos, um, it works uh, just great. It also has um, a wonderful macro lens right now. So uh, you can turn right around and take pictures of beetles and other things with the same lens that you were using to photograph a golden eagle on a pole a mile away. So it's the Canon SX70. It's a little... Um, pep, um, uh, point and shoot, it costs a lot less than a, a lot, lot, lot less than a high power, uh, than a high end binocular. Um, as to the recorder, uh, there are lots of them out here. I use this little guy, it is an Olympus recorder, it's called the LS10, and um, it's a very, 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 very old hand me down from Bob Zilly. It actually um, was lost in the snow for three months at um, um, 
uh, Valmont, what's that other reservoir? A Lagerman Reservoir a couple of winters ago, and the ranger found it, and it still works. So talk about takes a lick and keeps on ticking. But this thing is uh, now more than 10 years old. It has been abused in every way imaginable, and it still makes very good um, quality sounds. Uh, these Olympus products are very, very good. There's some, uh, Sony has a really nice one as well. But um, this is a designated recorder specifically for sounds and nothing else. I also want to urge you all, though, to think about simply using your phones. These phones work really, really well. This is an iPhone 7, I think. I don't know. I think I have the lowest grade iPhone in the family. But um, the more recent smartphones have very, very good uh, audio capability. You can get um, external um, enhancements like a microphone. They're not really um, very helpful. You can also get apps that help to um, uh, boost the signal, boost the sound uh, somewhat. But basically, if you go to your in, built in voice memos app, make sure you point the microphone at the bird. That's very important. You can get perfectly serviceable uh, documentation of birds, including rare birds. So you can use a designated object like this one. You can use your phone. Oh, and speaking of cameras, um, something else you can do, I don't have my binoculars right in front of me. You can just hold your camera up to your binoculars and do something called digibinning and get perfectly serviceable photos of birds that way as well. I've seen some very credible documentation of some impressively rare birds by holding a cell phone up to a camera. Okay, before, um, I think we've gotten through most of the uh, questions. If okay. you still have a question, you can put it in the comments for the chat, please. Um, but I wanted to announce that this is being recorded and we, uh, the Colorado field ornithologists have our own YouTube channel and we will post this on that YouTube channel so you can rewatch or fast forward it to any part um, to go over Ted's talk as well as the other ones that we've recorded this year. So uh, right now I haven't seen any more uh, questions. Great. And gang, I'm I'm well. I'm happy to um, stick around here. At some point, if we're sure that the chat has been um, exhausted, um, I am happy to um, let folks uh, unmute. <laughs> It'll be controlled babble, I suppose. But um, if you want to shout out a question, that would be fine um, as well. But I just want to make sure that we don't have anything coming in the written chat first. I kind of want to prioritize that. But um, I think there are some more chat questions here. Okay. Let's see. And we will open up the uh, the floor in a minute. Oh, I see that I'm somebody uh, <laughs> digit bumming. I, I love that. Maybe I'll call it that. Yeah, thank you for. I, I went too fast there. No, it's called digit binning. Um, it's sort of a made up word. The digit is as in digital, and then binning as in using your binoculars. But I like digit bumming. Um, no, so it's called digit binning, and it's the uh, practice of holding your phone up to your uh, binocular. Hang on, let me get a binocular. I'll show you how this is done. I'm going to disappear for just about five seconds here. Well, Ted has disappeared. I'll, I'll make a comment. So I mentioned earlier the uh, the Colorado Birding Challenge. We will be using eBird to record our sightings during the challenge. Uh, so this is this is uh, offered in part to make sure that everybody's trained on the use of eBird. Go ahead, Ted. Okay. So I, I've got a binocular here, and let's pretend I've got a rare bird over here. All I do is just hold the there we go the um, the camera eye up to the binocular, and I look through the other lens and make sure it's there and then I click go. Um, I've noticed that in general, this works better um, with young people who are very steady of hand, uh, but I've also seen impressive results from uh, just about anybody. So you just hold your binocular up, get the camera eye right, have that right, yeah, right in front of it, look through the other eye, through, through the other lens, make sure you see the bird. Um, for me, because I just sort of shake around a lot, I try to put the, um, uh, the binocular itself on some steady um, surface, like the um, side of a fence or a tree. Um, actually, kids' shoulders work really well, but the kids have gotten too tall now, so I can't do that anymore. But um, it's a great practice, and if you're out in the field and you just have your binoculars and your phone and you left all the other gear at home, uh, you can get great documentation by digibinning, not digit bumming, but I do like digit bumming. <laughs> okay, right. another question, Ted. Yep. Why are my photos of rare flag birds marked with an exclamation point for a few weeks. That's from yeah. Catherine. Yeah, hi, Catherine. I saw that question from earlier. So um, I don't know, but um, I have a guess, and it's the following. 
there might be something about the entire checklist that caused it to be invalidated. So if your checklist, for example, is um, covers too many miles, and, and there, there can be some other reasons uh, for which it would be invalidated, then all the media and all of the records associated with it also don't go into the public database. I actually noticed this myself um, just a few days ago. I needed to, I don't know why I needed to, but I needed to get some Merlin photo, uh, photos of Merlin. It's not the app Merlin, the bird, the Merlin. And one of mine was in there and it had a big red triangle by it. And I was like, what is wrong with this? It's the most obvious Merlin imaginable. In fact, it was easily identifiable to subspecies. So the problem is, and it makes all the sense in the world, that was um, my Christmas count checklist and my Christmas count territory you know, I bird from, I don't know, five in the morning till 6 p.m. or something like that, winds all over the place. It's much more than the uh, mileage allotment allowed by eBirds. So because the checklist was too long, the media associated with it were too long as well. So Catherine, I'm gonna guess that there's something wrong with the checklist, not with the bird itself. Um, the Colorado reviewers are fast. They tend to get on rare birds, you, know, you said weeks, I mean, certainly faster than um, weeks from now. But I'm assuming we're talking about a Colorado bird, not a bird from somewhere else. But, hey, Ted, so, could yeah, you my, my, talk about, uh, could you also mention the amount of miles on a checklist? Right. So eBird has a um, upper limit of uh, uh, five miles for the, um, sorry, the um, validity of a checklist. So if you've traveled more than five bird miles, you're supposed to stop at that point and start a new checklist. Um, I understand this in terms of analysis. Um, I don't quite understand it in terms of the uh, great variation in habitats that are out there. So if I'm in just a vast pine forest and I walk six miles instead of five miles, that does feel like I'm still eBirding the same place, but eBird just has that arbitrary cutoff at five miles. Here's a question that you might not have answered already. Yep. eBird requires very little weather and geographical, ge ge geographical data. Uh, what? What's the proper place to add these details? Oh yeah, so that's the third time I've answered the question now, but that's fair, in the comment section. Just put everything in the comment section. Um, for weather, absolutely. I Even back in the bad old days when I wasn't e-birding as carefully as I am now, I did try to at least say something like raining or windy or stormy or smoky. And th those are useful comments. Um, as to geographical information, so your location is fixed by where you are. You have to create a location and same thing with time. Now it is very valuable though to, excuse me, to um, provide additional information on where you went. So let's just use the example of, <laughs> if there are any of my Pittsburgh friends still out there, I, I, I'm thinking of Frick Park, for example. There's so many different ways of birding Frick Park. You can just do Clayton Trail, you can do North Clayton Trail, you can do South Clayton Trail. So just instead of just putting the stick pin for Frick Park in there, say where you went, that's really useful to somebody uh, coming back for the checklist later. Um, and then um, of course the big bug, I'm gonna come back to Colorado now, is for a place that has multiple locations within sort of a, a, a bigger family of checklists, and I, uh, sorry, of hotspots, I think of, um, uh, Chatfield State Park. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, yes, Chatfield State Park. There are so many hot spots associated with Chatfield State Park. You can go to this marina and that marina and the west side and the east side and you know, Jefferson County and Douglas County. I think I have those counties right and so forth and so on. So you do need to be careful about the location that way. But um, you, if you either drop a stick pin or go to a designated hot spot. You will be in a place on this earth and then the um, time is going to be um, specified based on when you start anyhow. So Ted, I've noticed that some people prefer to create a personal location rather than use the hotspot where they are located. Yeah. I, <laughs> the benefits of both approaches and how eBird uses hotspot data. Yeah, okay, so, um, so I'm Ted and I'm, I can editorialize, but there's also eBird and Macaulay and I recognize that they have their way of doing things as well. And we do need to follow along um, to prevent things from becoming complete chaos. So eBird, strongly encourages users to use um, predefined agreed upon names for places. So if I really, really want to call um, Walden Ponds, Schmalden Ponds, I just love that name. It's not helping anybody according to eBird at all. They want as much uniformity in there as well. And there are some things about eBird that, um, that I don't personally agree with. We already talked, for example, about the X's. Um, I wish I could put an X in there instead of a number, but I understand that eBird wants us to put numbers. So I'm playing along there. And actually, I'm really glad for whoever asked that question because that's gonna uh, let me go into another um, soapbox real briefly here, but it's my soapbox anyhow. So um, 
eBird is a communal database. It's something that we all use together. It's an invaluable resource. Um, I think that's become as powerful and as universal and birding now as um, binoculars or a field guide. But there's a big difference between binoculars and a field guide on the one hand and eBird on the other. If you misuse your binoculars or if you misuse your field guide, you're only hurting yourself. And I can, I've can i seen all sorts of strange ways of using binoculars and field guides. And I can certainly tell you not to use your binoculars that way or not to use your field guide that way. But with eBird, when you just sort of go in there and do things your own way, you are kind of messing it up for everybody else. So for me, if you just want to look through the, uh, the big end of your binocular and hold it upside down like this, be my guest. To me, that's sort of like, you know, peeing on your own bathroom floor. It only hurts. Oops, what happened? Am I still here? You're still there. Oh, I'm still here. Um, it only affects you. But using eBird the wrong way is a little bit like peeing in the swimming pool. You're messing it up for everybody if you do that. So yes, there are some things about eBird that I would do differently, but I also understand that in order for the database to have uniformity and to be valuable analytically, we sort of do need to do it all ourselves. So long-winded answer to that question, I'm right there with you. There have been times when I really wanted to change the name of a hotspot, but I think we need to stick with the name that's out there. Okay, I think we can open it up to people to ask questions. If you, all you have to do is unmute yourself and ask the questions. Is when you're done, go ahead and mute yourself. And if this gets out of out of hand, we'll <laughs> have a, a hand raising uh, rule. But let's see how it goes. Look, you can even use the reactions button. Look at that. It's not cool. All right, sorry. Anybody want to shout something out here? Anybody know how to do that? Yeah, Ted. This is a question. This is Elena. Hi, I wonder if you could mention the, the sort of the ethics of if there's a sensitive bird that shouldn't be disturbed if if it's better to not put it in eBird or right. not. Or what yeah, that's, that. Thanks. That's a great question. But we could talk about eBird all night long, couldn't we? Yeah. So um, there are a lot of issues there, and some of them don't really even involve um, disturbance to a bird. But let's just say seeing a bird on private property. Yeah, you just found a. a a violet ear in your yard and you don't want everybody coming to see it. You know, that's actually, you're right. You don't have to tell anybody um, about that. So um, eBird uh, routinely um, sort of blurs or masks the location of a species of special concern. If you look for it, I, I can't think of examples off the, sorry about this, off the top of my head. Um, you can, um, you'll just see, sort of see a square that corresponds to an area of maybe like 10 square miles or something uh, like that. Uh, certainly for birds that are quite sensitive, I think of owls in Central Park, for example, I do recommend uh, using um, discretion. There's no reason that you have to eBird a bird the day you saw it. You can wait for a month until it flies away or something like that and go back in and put it in your database. But yeah, I haven't talked about the ethics of eBirding at all. Um, that's a huge issue. I think it's an important issue. And I think it's one that's going to become increasingly uh, significant as we go forward. But there are issues of privacy, like human privacy, and there are issues of avian welfare that the um, that eBird is good about. They're good at masking locations. Um, you can submit um, uh, private records that nobody else can see, but that reviewers in some cases can see. Sometimes, sometimes they can't even see it at all. And uh, those are all um, good ways to go forward. But uh, B, um, Practice um, discretion, uh, be judicious about what you're doing and um, don't run afoul of the uh, rights of other people and also the welfare of birds. This question just came in from Kevin Ash. Is there such a thing as submitting too many eBird checklists? Yeah, um, <laughs> in terms of your own health, yeah, probably. I think maybe I eBirded it too much, but um, no, um, I think that the, actually one of our own uh, here in um, Colorado, David Sudji, and at least for a while there was, I think like, at the top of the leaderboard with tens of thousands of checklists. As long as you're applying best practices and you're know, submitting for the most part complete checklists and carefully observing what you're seeing, the more the merrier. Um, if they're all coming from the same place over and over and over and over again, the, uh, excuse me, the database is um, very robust to that type of repetition and knows how to diminish the uh, uh, influence of a particular location like that to the overall analysis. So. Um, I might question um, from a mental health perspective, whether you want to be entering uh, tens or thousands of checklists per day, but um, in terms of the database, it's well equipped to handle that type of volume. Hey, Ted, mm -hmm. um, somebody asked, uh, you know, cause we're getting ready to do the Colorado birding challenge mm -hmm. and we've asked all the participants to do eBird checklists. Uh, could you talk about how to approach an, an entire county uh, with eBird checklists for a day? So you, um, 
Okay, so well, instead so of the, doing one checklist, you right, would right. do multiple checklists okay. kind of thing? Okay, so uh, yes, that would be the best way. So if you went to 30 different places, back to Kevin's question, you would in fact uh, enter 30 different checklists. However, you can um, enter checklists at the county level. Um, suppose you just don't want to be bothered with entering 30 different checklists for Boulder County. You can do a stick pin called Boulder. Now, that's an imprecise location, and it will be, um, this is to uh, Catherine's point, um, the checklist will be invalidated because it's too general, but you still get to use it for your own list keeping purposes, um, for remembering what you saw that day, and perhaps eventually for going back in and actually breaking it up on a location by location basis. I have to chuckle um, with you all about something. The, the most famous eBird checklist of all time is the um, Sapsuckers uh, record-breaking Texas eBird checklist from, it was many Mays ago. They saw 294 species. The location was Texas and every single entry I think had an X on it. It's like the worst eBird checklist of all time. It was um, entered by perhaps the five greatest birders of our generation by folks who work at Macaulay and that's fine. It was just a recreational checklist. It was obviously invalidated, but I just think it's kind of funny and ironic that the most famous checklist of all time is an invalid checklist. Any other questions? Okay. Well, gang, as you all start to drop off, although I- Hold on, hold on, hold on, oh, hold on, hold on Teddy. We do have a question. Claire makes you have to unmute, unmute yourself. You're muted. Okay, hi Ted. Um, how is this information used exactly? Like, um, if if I go out to Windsor Lake, I live by Windsor, and there's fifteen hundred geese, and I was trying to get really accurate, and then I was like, oh, I bet someone else already took numbers, and I sort of gave up. Mm -hmm. I, if there are multiple people doing the same lake, like, what are you guys, or what's happening on the background? Are there algorithms? Yep. Is it? Are you making population counts? What exactly is happening? So the short answer to your question is yes, there are there are algorithms. There's a black box. Um, eBird uh, is is well equipped to handle uh, multiple inputs for the same place at the same point in time. And if you now, as to the specifics of the algorithm, if you say they're fifteen hundred and I said they're eighteen hundred, I'm not sure exactly how that works. But you're not gumming up the works. You're not breaking the internet. You're not destroying uh, the eBird by going in and entering a checklist uh, that somebody else did. You can see this in an extreme um, level with uh, rare bird uh, stakeouts. So if if David finds another state first, um, and you know there are uh, 275 checklists from there, all with that same rare bird. That's fine. The, the database knows that everybody was at the same place at, the, at, at, at probably the same point in time. So you're not doing anything harmful, except from the point I went back to with uh, five ways of being a better eBirder. You're not really helping the matter um, at all. The best thing to do when there's a rare bird is to go find your own rare bird somewhere else. And I really actually do, do mean that. Um, finding stuff on your own is the best way to promote the database. That said, if you're going to a place where other people are already active, um, finding the same birds, that uh, duplication of effort does not break the database, the database is well equipped to handle it. So go ahead, Bird Lake Windsor. And if somebody else is there, that's fine too. Okay, thanks. Cool. Yep. Ted, it's mm -hmm. Linda now. Um, I missed when you said Hannah was gonna do her iNaturalist event. When is that gonna be, or does it matter? It's Tuesday night. Tuesday night? Yep, okay. and there was a link there. Um, so yeah. watch, the, watch this on YouTube and get the link. <laughs> okay, thanks. I'm not sure the, the video will be available by Tuesday night, but it might be. Um, okay, tell you what, um, that was Linda. Linda, I'll email you the link. Okay, cool. Any other questions? If there are no other questions, we will, we will terminate this presentation tonight. Thank you very much, Ted. Yep, and thanks, Ted. Nick. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, everybody. And... Um, Great to see and hear from some of you all and we'll follow up later. Thanks. Ted, can you put Hannah's uh, presentation URL in the chat box before um, you get off? So you may be taxing my um, ability here. I think it was in your presentation. I know. Hang on, am uh, I still here? Me, Wait, tell I, it to I, me and I'll just post it in no, the chat tell, box. Tell you, oh no, I, I'm, I have ways, hang on, we're getting there. All righty. It's tinyurl.com slash nature uh, dash 
Wait, hang on. Uh, I'm, 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 dash I'm putting. I'm putting it in the chat. Yeah, but there, there. You got to watch out for that case sensitivity, though. So, there it is. Oh, and somebody. Oh, I just did that privately. Um, well, I just told Michelle where it is. <laughs> I can only talk to Michelle. Help! What do I do here? Um, I'm in a private chat. Let's try this. So look where it says two. Two. And then just toggle to the top where it says everyone. To, oh. And Ooh. there is one more question. Um, Kevin asks, I've had birds under review show up. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The question was, um, what should we do? There, I just sent it to everyone. Okay. Great. Sorry, what was the question? The question is, is there a way to tell if a bird under review has been rejected? Yeah. Um, so in general, here in Colorado, um, the reviewers will usually communicate with you on a person by person and record by record basis. So uh, typically, I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that question. I mean, usually an observ sorry, an inquiry comes from the reviewer to the person who saw the bird. And if there's some sort of good faith effort to say, yeah, it really was what I think it was, or I'm sorry, I made a mistake. There's almost always follow up on that. If you're, um, but you're, that's, that's a different question. You're saying, was it rejected without my knowing it? And I don't know how you would um, look into that other than to go into the public database a week later or a month later and see if the record's in there. That reminds me of like Catherine's um, question about the birds that just aren't showing up there. And again, I, as I said, I suspect that has to do with a checklist, although I could be wrong about that. So if it's a particular bird, I find that the reviewers on a person by person basis do a really good job of reaching out to the person who uh, submitted the record. That, that, that's a good question. Um, I don't rarely encounter that. Can I tag on, may I tag on to that question or that yeah. response real quick? Um, any way to contact a reviewer before the submission to clarify things while we're kind of learning? Yeah, um, so they're humans and they, they only have so many hours in the day but I find that most of the reviewers welcome inquiries like that. I mean, don't be, be respectful of their time. Um, if you just really want to learn house finches and goldfinches, you might want to do something different. But if you're dealing with a slaty backed gull up in um, Larimer County and you're not absolutely sure of whether it's first cycle or second cycle, yeah, it's, I think it's fine to go uh, straight to a reviewer. Um, that said, I think that the most efficient way is in fact to upload the record um, with as much evidence and um, context as you can and let the reviewers do their thing. Right, okay, I really appreciate that clarification, but how would we even find a reviewer? How do we know who they are? They're out yeah, there. that's tricky. Um, I, wonder, yeah, I wonder if they're actually out. So. infringe on their time and their... Yeah, exactly, and I am wary of that. I mean, I don't think you should be um, asking reviewers to okay. teach you how to right. identify birds, but 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 that said, I mean, if it's if it's a tricky, Report and again, Nick and I were talking about a sleepy back gull in Larimer County earlier today. I don't see it. That, I mean, that's a significant record. I don't see a problem with uh, reaching out to a reviewer um, beforehand. But um, again, they are people with schedules and lives, and they can't field every uh, e email that comes their way. I would say that the the default assumption would be, in fact, to upload the record and await review. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure you touched on this point, but it's it comes up a lot with with new users of eBird that feel offended when a reviewer contacts them questioning their identification. Can you comment on, on whether they should feel offended or, or, or how they should handle reporting birds that are rare that may, you know, they may or may not be what they think. So Nick, is that question from you or from someone else? No. <laughs> well, I'm asking, I'm, I'm asking this question for the benefit of everybody. I gotcha. I'm kind of joking. It's getting late. No. Okay. So, um, eBird has to have quality control. I mean, otherwise anything could, could get in there. And of course, most um, a, a bad record is eventually going to be uh, deleted if there's no communication with the um, reviewer at all. Again, this is Ted editorializing, not necessarily Macaulay. I find the form letter that Macaulay sends out to be unfriendly. I would have worded it differently, but that's just me. Um, typically the reviewer though will add something personal at the beginning, like, hey, I was wondering why you think this was, you know, X instead of Y or something um, along those lines. But um, eBird is not personal private listing software. That point again about you know peeing in the swimming pool versus peeing on your bathroom floor. It is a database that 
scientists from all over the world use to make decisions about conservation policy. So some amount of accuracy needs to be in there. Um, I get queried a lot and um, different folks have different styles. Um, I actually make a point when somebody queries something. I just got queried, um, a Chetty's warbler of mine from France just got queried. I was really grateful to the guy. I even like figured out how to write back to him in French just to like say how grateful I was for the for the learning experience. So um, these people aren't paid. Um, they're helping to make the database better. And I guess I sort of reflexively um, jump on the side of the reviewers here. They are um, really, really. They're, they're not more. They're more than important. They're vital for 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 quality uh, control. And um, don't take it personally. I assure you, I have been queried by reviewers from all over the world in multiple languages. And that's a reflection, of course, of the fact that I eBird a lot, but also that I make a lot of mistakes. We all do. Well, so, so let me uh, go back to the Slated Back Gull example. <laughs> uh, here's a bird that I saw yesterday with some other people, and we think it's Slated Back Gull, but we're not 100% certain. So we put it in eBird as Laris species. And we sent, and I sent an email to CoBirds today saying there may be a, a Slated Back Gull in Larimer County. Should I have submitted it to eBird as Slated Back Gull, even though I'm not certain? Okay, so CoBirds and um, eBird are not the same thing. I think what you did with CoBirds was fine. You just said, hey, it might be a, such a burden that anybody can make a decision based on what they know of you and whether they're like birds and whether they're like gulls and whether they have time. That's that's the way CoBirds works. Um, without knowing much about the record, assuming there's at least some reason for thinking that it's a Slated Back Gull, I would recommend, in fact, calling it a Slated Back Gull. Um, because if Laris Spa is not going to even trip the filter, somebody might not even notice that you saw that. Um, so there have been times when I've uh, deliberately tripped the filter because I had a bird in there that I really wanted somebody to pay attention to. See, I don't mind rejection, I, I guess. I, I actually prefer uh, that somebody pay attention to something that I've got there. So I would recommend that you call it Sladyback Gull. And I would begin the comment by saying provisional identification, you know, dear eBird reviewer, please um, um, take, I assume their photos or a description or something like that, you know, please, please advise. So I'm a fan of um, tripping the filter, that is to say, uh, initiating the review process um, with the understanding that somebody might come back and say, no, I think you should probably change this to Laris Spa. That, that's a fancy way of saying an unidentified goal. I appreciate that answer. Thank you very much. Okay. We've gotten into the realm of slady back gulls. The uh, the night is young. Um, well, that's all questions? the questions that that are on the list. So, so uh, Ted, we can't thank you enough for a great presentation. Oh, sure, uh, you can't. No, I'm joking. Um, it was clear <laughs> and concise and uh, funny. Well, thanks, <laughs> the great. dumpster diving had me cracking up. I had good, to turn my good. video off. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Yeah, and I'm sorry. Oh, oh, by the way, when you do get into the video on my checklist, there's sound effects as well. Okay. There were several comments saying that uh, people wanted more information from you, Ted. So we may be calling you back for, 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 for an encore. Yeah, you know, at, at, at the, yeah an encore or maybe, um, maybe we could even be sort of like user directed um, if there seemed to be some um, key themes. Um, like I always get at the, the camera question, no matter what. I mean, um, now there are many, photographers far more competent than I um, with uh, photography. Uh, that goes without saying. But uh, yeah, if there's sort of a critical mass of um, sort of a specific class of questions, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, great. Thank you all very much. Thank you for attending, everybody. And we'll see many of you at the next birding, uh, better um, birding skills workshop series. Thank you very much. Yep. Nick, do I go away now? If you want to, you can stay on. I'm just stopping the recording here. Oh, oh cool. Okay.